.NET 9 was released recently and one of the things that we got is a new caching library called Hybrid Cache. In this video, I'm going to explore the Hybrid Cache API, discuss what problems it solves and why it might be a better option than the existing caching abstractions that we have in .NET. Here's the example that we are going to explore to demonstrate the Hybrid Cache API. I have a typed HTTP client called the OMDB API client. OMDB is short for Open Movie Database. And we're going to specify an identifier for a given movie and try to fetch that using the HTTP client. So our initial solution doesn't have any caching in place. Let me quickly run it using .NET Aspire. We're going to open up the Aspire dashboard where you can see that our API is running. And if I jump into Postman and send a request for a movie with this ID, I picked this up from IMDB, we're going to get a response back and you can see that the movie in this example is Avatar. The response contains a bunch of information about this movie, like the movie ratings, the title, the description, the actors, and so on. But the point is, this could be an expensive operation. If we jump back to the Aspire dashboard and take a look at the traces, you can see what a given trace looks like. We have an API request landing on the minimal API endpoint, and then we have a trace for the HTTP request to the Open Movie Database API. So we might consider introducing caching so that we don't have to call the Open Movie Database API. So how can we do something like this? Here is the one API endpoint that we have, and the standard approach for introducing caching would be using something like iMemory Cache. The iMemory Cache is natively available in .NET, and it's specific because it stores all of the cached objects in the available memory on your server. If you want to introduce caching services, you can call builder services add memory cache, and this will register the required abstractions. Now, when it comes to using this interface, it's actually very straightforward because there are a set of extension methods that can make this simpler. For example, we could use get or create async where we specify a given cache key, let's say movies, and then we'll specify the IMDB ID as the cache key. And then we need to provide a function, which is our factory function that gives us access to the cache entry. And we need to provide a delegate that's going to return the actual cached value. This delegate is just going to be the call to the movie API, and we're going to return the cached movie. I'm also going to introduce a variable that's going to hold the cache movie, and then we're going to go ahead and return that from our API endpoint. Now, what you can also do is access the cache entry, and you can set when this cache entry should expire, for example, relative to now, and let's say I want to hold this for a total of five minutes. So if I start the application again, and we jump into Postman, and I'm going to send exactly two API requests. The first request, should reach out to the Open Movie Database API and give us back the movie, but the second request is going to return the cached value. If we take a look at the distributed traces, we can actually confirm this because here is the first request, and you can see we have our API call and an HTTP request. Now, if I take a look at the trace for the second request, there is just our API call because we are returning the cached value. So if we already have caching in place with iMemory cache, then why was it necessary to introduce a new caching abstraction like hybrid cache? Well, first of all, iMemory cache is limited to the memory of a single server. So if you have a distributed application, you can't use iMemory cache. A second option could be using the iDistributed cache, and this is a more lightweight caching abstraction that you can connect to a backing store like Redis or SQL Server where you are going to store your cache entries. Now, the advantage of distributed cache is that it works in a distributed system. Moreover, if your API restarts, you're not going to lose any cached values because they are stored separately from your API server's memory. However, iDistributed cache has a problem because the API for this abstraction is binary and you will have to serialize all your values into bytes. When it comes to iMemory cache, it's just going to store the object reference in the server's memory. This could also be problematic, but there's an even bigger problem with both of these abstractions. iDistributed cache and iMemory cache, 
do not have stampede protection. This happens when you get multiple API requests for the same API key and none of the concurrent requests find the cached value. So all of them are going to call the external API to fetch the data, which could be detrimental to performance and drastically reduce the available resources on your server. And you're also just doing unnecessary work. And this is exactly what hybrid cache tries to solve. So let's see how we can use our new caching abstraction. I'm going to install a new NuGet package and I will have to look for the pre-release version because at the time of recording this video there still isn't a stable release although this one is pretty safe to use. So let's go ahead and install the latest preview version of the Microsoft Extensions Caching Hybrid Library. So I'm going to install this NuGet and then what do we have to do to use this? We'll have to register the required services and you will say builder services add hybrid cache. You also have an option to configure the hybrid cache options. And what could be interesting here is setting the default cache entry options. This is an instance of the hybrid cache entry options type. And what makes hybrid cache unique is because it actually combines the local and a distributed cache. So we have a level one and a level two cache. So if you want to set the expiration time for the local cache, which actually uses iMemory cache under the hood, then you can set the local cache expiration. And let's say that this is five minutes by default. And if you want to configure the expiration on the distributed server, then you will set the expiration property. And I'm also going to set it to five minutes. Now, because these APIs are in preview, you will get some compiler warnings. And I'm going to disable this with a pragma comment. And now we should be able to use the hybrid cache service in our API endpoint. So let's replace this with hybrid cache. And this is actually an abstract class that our libraries can also implement to add support for hybrid caching. How you use it is almost identical to how we were using the memory cache. So there is a get or create async method. And this is the intended way of how you should use hybrid cache. Now, instead of a cache entry, what you will get here is a cancellation token. So I can grab the token here and then propagate the token to my API call. And I will need to directly pass in the actual cancellation token to the get or create async method. Now, what you can also do here is provide an array of tags that allows you to tag your cache entries. Let's say I provide the tag movies. And why is this useful? Well, hybrid cache also supports invalidation based on these tags. So this gives you a simple way to invalidate multiple cache entries. So let's go ahead and start the API again. And I'm going to send exactly two API requests. Here is the first request, and then here is the second request. And again, if we jump into distributed traces, you can see that we have our initial API request here together with the HTTP request to the movies API. Now, why these aren't the same trace is probably because the open telemetry setup for tracing with hybrid cache isn't able to connect these two spans. But in any case, you can see that we have our API request and an HTTP request to a third party API. Now the second API request is just going to hit our API and return the cache value. So this is how we can use hybrid cache for caching. There is the get or create async that basically implements the cache aside pattern. Now the added benefit is that this also supports cache stampede protection, which I'm going to demo a bit later. Now what are some other APIs that we have with hybrid cache? I'm going to make a copy of this endpoint. Let's update it to a put endpoint or better yet a delete endpoint and let's call it invalidate cache. I won't be needing the movie API client, so we can get rid of that. The API endpoint is just going to return results, no content, whatever happens inside. And then I'm going to use our hybrid cache to remove a value from the cache. So I can say remove async, let's say await remove async. Let's specify the cache key, which is movies and then IMDB ID. And I can also pass in the cancellation token. Now I mentioned that there is also tag based eviction. This is made available by the remove by tag async method, where you can specify one or more tags that you can use to remove cache entries. Now, if we go into the implementation for this method, you will see that it's basically going to call the remove by tag async 
or if there are multiple tags is going to iterate over each one and then try to remove them from the cache. Now this is going to take care of both the level one and level two cache. So you're going to invalidate the local cache, which is the memory cache and an optional distributed cache if you configured it. So I think this is actually pretty cool. Now let's say that we just want to use basic eviction and let's start our API and I'm going to add a breakpoint in my minimal API endpoint in the factory function. So if I send an initial API request to fetch the movies, we're going to land in the breakpoint in the factory function of the get or create async method. So let's hit continue and we're going to get the response back in Postman. Now, if I send this a couple more times, you will see that we are not hitting this breakpoint because we are able to return the cache value. Now, if I invalidate the cache by calling our new delete endpoint and I send this request again, you will see that we do hit the breakpoint because the value is removed from the cache. So now it's going to be cached again and available for subsequent requests. If you need to be able to manually set the value inside of the cache, there is the set async method, which accepts a key and a value, and hybrid cache is also going to take care of serialization. Now, when it comes to serialization, you also have an option to configure a custom serializer. If you need this, you can call the add serializer method and provide your specific implementation. Now, what I want to show you next is how to introduce Redis as a level two cache. So let's go into Aspire and let's install an Aspire package. And I'm going to install Aspire hosting Redis. So let's install this NuGet package. And then inside of the app host, I'm going to say builder add Redis. Let's give it the name of Redis. And I will need a variable so that I can reference this from my API. Then I'm going to say with reference and pass in the Redis resource. And I'm also going to tell the API to wait for the Redis resource to become available until it starts. So this is something that was added in .NET 9. And if you're running in earlier versions of .NET, then these are available through NuGet packages managed by the community. So this is enough for us to spin up our Redis instance and connect it with our application. So this is going to create a respective connection string. Now, when it comes to using this inside our API, we're going to install a client side Aspire package and the one I'm looking for is Aspire Stack Exchange Redis Distributed Caching. So let's go ahead and install that one. So this is going to give us a new extension method and you're going to access it from the web application. So I'm going to say builder add Redis distributed cache. And then I need to provide the name of my Redis resource and this is just Redis. And this is going to configure an Aspire integration for the I distributed cache interface. Hybrid cache is going to pick up on this automatically and is going to start using the respective I distributed cache implementation. So let's see if this is actually working. I'm going to start the application again and the Aspire dashboard is going to open up where you can see our Redis container starting in the background together with our movies API. Now, if I take a look at the environment variables, you will see that there is a connection string to the Redis resource with the respective local host address. So this is something that's configured by Aspire. And if I send a request to fetch a movie based on an ID, we're going to get this value from the API and then we're going to cache it. And you can see that the subsequent requests are pretty fast. If we go into the distributed traces, you can see that there is a bit more going on. So here is the API request to fetch a movie with a given ID. Now there are a couple of more spans here and these are actually sent to the Redis instance. And this is the distributed cache working in the background together with hybrid cache. So you can see we're trying to fetch the value from the Redis if it exists. And for any subsequent requests, you can see that we are able to serve the value from the cache. Now, if I go into the resources and I stop the movies API, and this is going to clear out the memory cache for this API, and I restart it, I will still be able to return the cached value because it's available in Redis. So if I go ahead and send this request, you can see that we get response quickly. And if we take a look at the traces, you can see the latest request here, which is able to return this value from Redis. What is missing is the API request to the movies API, which is this span here. You can see that we aren't sending this request in the latest trace here, which is able to return the cached value from Redis because hybrid cache is going to automatically pick up on the respective distributed cache implementation. If I try to invalidate my cache entry with both the level one and the level two cache running and we take a look at the distributed traces, you can see our API request 
as well as a request to Redis to remove a cache entry for a given key. So together with distributed tracing, we can confirm that everything is working how we would expect it to. If you're enjoying this video so far, make sure to subscribe to my channel so that you don't miss any of my future videos. Also, go ahead and smash the like button right under this video to tell the YouTube algorithm to recommend this to other .NET developers. And there is one more important thing I want to demonstrate with hybrid cache. I'm going to paste in two implementations for a minimal API endpoint. The first one is going to be a get for a given movie based on an ID, and I'm going to postfix this with unsafe. We're going to use our iMemory cache, and this is just a standard implementation of the cache aside pattern with one added difference that I have a request counter, which is going to increment by one whenever we send a request to the external movie API. And the same thing again, in the other endpoint, which I both fix with safe, that is using hybrid cache. And one more thing I'm going to do is also return the number of API requests that should tell us how many times we called the external movie API. So let's go ahead and run this. And here's what I'm going to do. I have four requests open and I'm going to quickly send a request to the API endpoint from all of the tabs. And you will see that we are getting the response back. And the API request count is one in this example, and two in this example, and three in this example, and four in the last request. Something else you can see is that for all of the values, it takes about two seconds to complete the request. And remember that we are fetching the same movie in all of our requests. So this is actually the cache stampede happening because we don't have a cache value for this cache entry and we reach out to the external API to fetch this value in all of the requests. If we take a look at the distributed traces, we can also confirm this because all of the API requests have two spans inside, one for the request to our API and another for the HTTP request to the external movie API. So you can see that we are doing unnecessary work, even though we are fetching the same movie in all of the API requests. So let's switch to the safe endpoint, and I'm going to start sending the requests concurrently. And you can see that the first request took about two and something seconds. And this is because I have a manual delay in all of the endpoints, but the remaining requests all return pretty quickly. So you can see 200 milliseconds here, 900 here, and four milliseconds here. So what's happening? This is actually hybrid caches stampede protection working for us. And if we take a look at the distributed traces, you can see the request to the safe endpoint on our API, which is reaching out to Redis, and there is exactly one call to the external movie API. Here is the API endpoint and the one unsafe request is because I forgot to update the value in Postman. But the important part is that hybrid cache is going to detect that we have concurrent requests for the same cache key. It's going to implement a locking mechanism under the hood and prevent these concurrent requests to execute the factory method, which is what is calling the external API. So this is how we end up with just one call to the movie API. Here is the span for this call, and all of the other requests are going to wait for the factory function to complete, and then they're going to return the cached value without having to reach out to the external API. And all we had to do to introduce this in our solution is simply use the get or create async method. It's going to implement the cache aside pattern for you and it's also going to give you stampede protection. So all things considered, I think hybrid cache is a pretty awesome library and I'm excited we have it in the .NET ecosystem. If you enjoyed this video about the hybrid cache library, then I think you should watch this video next. Check out my clean architecture and modular monolith courses to improve your skills and until next time, stay awesome.